everybody. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, today's discussion is about the circular economy. You may be sitting in your seats asking yourself, what is the circular economy? Uh, you will walk away with the answer to that question. Um, thanks to the four people who are sitting here with me today. Um, we'll also be talking about why this is important now, how public and private entities are joining together to create systemic um, materials Is this better? Yes. Oh, much better. Great. OK. So today we're going to talk about the circular economy. These four uh, experts are going to actually enlighten us about what the circular economy is. My name is Emily Rube. I'm a reporter for The New York Times. And I've been digging into the guts of New York City, writing a series about infrastructure called New York 101, explaining how we get our electricity, how we get our water. Last year, I wrote a story about um, uh, how New York City is rolling out the country's largest organics recycling program, and I was astounded to learn how much waste we produce every day. New Yorkers produce about two pounds of waste every day, and that's just at home. Um, so I'd like to introduce our, introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Jacqueline Kramer, um, who has been working in sustainability long before sustainability was a thing. Um, and among her many titles, um, she is the ambassador of the circular economy for the city of Amsterdam. Um, we have Amanda Weeks. Um, she is a Staten Island native who grew up uh, near the Fresh Kills landfill that used to be the largest, one of the largest in the world. And now she has started an ag tech um, uh, firm. She's the co-founder and CEO of Industrial Organic. Um, we have Michael Samuelian. Um, who is the president and CEO of the Trust for Governors Island, uh, which is essentially redeveloping uh, the 150-acre island from the ground up. And we have Kate Daly, who has spent more than a decade uh, in New York City government, um, and she's now the executive director of the Center for the Circular Economy at the Impact Investment Firm Closed Loop Partners. And Kate, I'm going to turn this over to you. Um, You've been going around giving a lot of presentations. Um, and you're setting up an R&D lab uh, for closed loop. And you're creating um, communities of social investors, researchers, entrepreneurs uh, who are interested in getting in this space. How are you describing the closed loop economy? What is it? I, I think that that definition of the circular economy is a critical one because often there's some it's a misunderstanding of what is the difference between sustainability and the circular economy. And the, the circular economy is really the opportunity to transition from our current linear take-make-waste economic system to a circular system where all of our materials and products are kept at their highest use at all time, where we keep resources in play, we keep molecules in play, and that we decouple the exhaustion of our finite natural resources from economic growth. And so the circular economy is a very exciting opportunity for, for many people because it allows for systems change without sacrificing profit. And so that's really you know, the, this effort that it's, the circular economy is not just about recycling, it's not just about that end of pipe capturing of resources, although that's a really critical component of it. But the circular economy is very mindful that 80% of a product's material um, environmental impact is determined at the moment of design. And so this moment of design is really an important part of the circular economy and this idea that you can design a product for disassembly, whether that's a building or a washing machine, and that you can use technology to track the life cycle of a material so that you can recapture its value at any given moment. And so there's a real intersection of technology, inter innovation, entrepreneurship, and the profit that corporations and other entities are identifying as an opportunity within the circular economy. So um, does anyone have anything they want to add to that? Um, I, Jacqueline, um, you know, you're, you're a professor. 
you are um, a strategic advisor to several entities, um, and you also live in a European city that soon will have nine waste streams. Um, in New York City, we've just introduced a, an organic stream, um, so we're, we're getting there. Um, tell us about your job as, as ambassador um, to the circular economy, and why about, tell us about what you do, and why is this important right now? Well, in Europe, circular economy is a buzzword. It's actually something that we embrace not only in the Netherlands, but also in other European countries. Uh, our country, the Netherlands, has formulated a circular economy policy at a national level. And in many different regions and municipalities, we are carrying out programs uh, well, according to that policy. In the metropolitan area of Amsterdam, we work together at different levels. The regional level, that is the level that I'm coordinating, it is an area uh, in which, of course, Amsterdam is important, but also uh, 22 other municipalities, 2.3 million uh, people together. And uh, we also work at the municipal level and at neighborhood level. Why do I say that? Because uh, all our activities are interrelated. You can't uh, make the transition, as Kate said, to a circular economy by yourself. You need to cooperate with all the actors. You need to make the change at different scales. And uh, my work as actually is um, in the first place to promote, refuse and reduce, but more than that also to uh, focus on product redesign and product reuse and high value recycling. And my job is to bring partners together, sometimes only business people, but sometimes a combination of um, government and business, in order to create a business case together. This is very crucial. We all focus on how can we do a better job by joining forces and making sure that the conditions are set for uh, investors to set up new plans which are uh, much more circular than we presently have. So my, actually my job is being a matchmaker, a change maker and uh, building networks. And what is fascinating in uh, the region of Amsterdam, but also in other parts of the Netherlands is that this movement is becoming big. Why? Because we see the opportunities, it is profitable, it reduces the environmental burden tremendously, and it also reduces uh, the um, dependence on uh, the import of all kinds of materials from elsewhere. We become more self-reliant. And that is in times where the world is quite uh, uncertain, important as well. And all the activities we do create innovation, new um, knowledge, uh, so it is actually something that we really want to join. So it is a positive movement. Mm -hmm. and, and we're, but we're talking also about changing massive systems and cultures, um, you know, where today, you know, most people I think w about, when, when they think about trash, they put it on the curb and then it disappears into a black hole of of nothingness. Um, we don't really think about the cost of all these things. Um, and Amanda, you're, you know, you're also on the front lines of this change. I mean, you're working in an industry, the waste industry, that has not changed for decades. Um, what are the, what are the levels uh, or the levers that you're you're pulling to affect change um, as you as you navigate this uh, with your with your startup? So <clears throat> just to give you some context, what my company does is offer infrastructure as a service to the waste industry for the organic waste stream, which is a lot of demand right now and not a lot of uh, solutions. And what we do is we reclaim organic materials, organic chemicals, carbon, water, 
that's present in organic waste and we isolate them and use them in manufacturing new products. We're bringing a cleaning product and an organic plant food to market later this year. And so when we go to open these facilities, we have a pilot facility currently in Newark, we're opening another pilot facility in New York City, and we have to go through a lot of regulation. And we have to go through a lot of regulation in very old and slow industries like waste. And we were able to, in New York State, um, have new permit guidelines written for us that would allow us to open and operate without a permit in 30 days. Um, and otherwise, we would have gone through probably a two-year permitting process to get permitted for the first time because this was something new. So we're trying to work within the confines of regulation and of governments and not just, you know, I think the, the startup terms usually uh, apologize instead of uh, ask for permission. Um, and so we're trying to work within the confines of that because we don't want to piss anybody off because we're doing something, we're doing infrastructure, we're doing something where you know, if we get shut down, we can't just go to another city and we're kind of screwed. Um, so taking what we're doing and going into you know, these offices and going to talk to politicians and like we're doing something good, we're creating jobs and trying to talk to people and create those um, those partnerships before we do anything has really helped us move quickly as opposed to just like ignoring ignoring them. And well, and, and and so for Michael, you know, you've worked on both sides of this. You've done, you're an architect, but you've also been on both sides of the public and private sides of innovation, working on these massive projects like the Hudson Yards and the redevelopment of lower Manhattan, Manhattan after 9-11. Um, Tell us about what you're doing at, uh, at Governor's Island um, and what are the, the, the governance structure is a little bit different in your case. Tell us about your project and, and how the, the, the framework within your working. Uh, sure. I always like to take a quick poll. Who here has been to Governor's Island? Raise your hand. Uh, anyone whose hand is not up, I invite you to play hooky and walk down South Street and come visit us. Uh, it is a beautiful yeah. island. Uh, nestled between Lower Manhattan and, and, and uh, downtown Brooklyn, uh, old army base that was transformed into a fantastic public park. But we are an island in the true sense. We don't have a tram, we don't have a bridge, we don't have a subway. So we are um, very, very aware of everything that goes on and comes off the island. So in terms of governance, the trust is basically like a mini municipality where we are charged with uh, the operations of the island, the maintenance of the buildings, the operations of the park, uh, maintaining the park, transportation on and off the park. So we know every single time something comes on the island, we know how it gets off the island. So by necessity, we are very sensitive to the circular economy and want to discourage use of um, stuff coming on and more importantly, discourage use of stuff coming off. Uh, some fun facts, we are actually a net importer of food scraps. We take food scraps from across the city uh, and make them into compost. Uh, we think part about how materials really shouldn't leave the island, if at all possible. If you go to, say, one of our food courts, uh, there's not a trash can. There's a recycle bin, and there's a compost bin, and that's it. Uh, as we think about what the future is, is how do we actually kind of retain as much as we can uh, on island? And what is unique about the trust is that we have this governance structure, unlike many cities, where we're not balkanized. We don't have a Department of Transportation. We don't have a Department of Parks. We don't have a Department uh, of uh, Economic Development. We at the Trust are basically charged with everything, the full cycle of development. So we're thinking creatively about how we could actually reduce uh, our use of stuff and how we could actually uh, eliminate the stuff coming off of it. And we're highly sensitive to kind of educating the public. Uh, I think one of the things that's unique about the island is that now all of a sudden New Yorkers and visitors see that, wow, maybe we're not creating trash. We're actually creating usable stuff, whether it's recyclable uh, plastics or um, foodstuffs that goes into our compost pile. So we think hard about how we can be a unique demonstration project for new technologies when it comes to how do we actually reduce stuff that we're using uh, on island. Yeah, and then that, that also makes me think about these unique partnerships um, and opportunities for cross-sector interaction, right? Breaking down the silos. And Kate, you're in this unique position where you're you're going around also as a catalyst, sort of making connections between academic institutions and uh, private entities and, and governments. Um, how are you? How are you creating these connections? And you know, 
as you make these, um, create these new cross-sector partnerships, like what, what works, or what, in your experience, what works? Um, well, I think going back to, to Michael's point about being on an island, those sorts of constraints foster innovation and creativity. And so in our economy, we haven't necessarily experienced the constraints that climate change, the, the changing drought patterns around the world are going to have an impact on the raw materials and resources that we're all using. And as those constraints become more felt, I think that we're going to see a, a rapid shift. But a lot of corporations around the world are already, especially in Europe, identifying that this is a risk issue for them in their investment. And th so they're anticipating the increased risk to their raw resources and are using the circular economy as an opportunity to maintain their growth and, and profit opportunities. In the United States, we haven't moved as quickly as Europe. We don't have regulations. We don't have European Commission giving millions of, of euros to each of the countries and cities in order to advance those efforts. And so in the absence of those incentives and with, with constraints not yet fully visible to us in some industries, um, we haven't seen as much of the public-private partnership. But one great example that I've seen is in Phoenix, where the city of Phoenix has partnered with Arizona State University to launch the country's first circular economy incubator, which is a, a partner incubator to our Center for the Circular Economy in New York City. And their focus right now is on accelerating startups who are dealing with the most difficult to recycle materials like batteries and coming up with really innovative approaches to harvesting those resources and identifying new uses for them. In New York City, we had, uh, have seen some cross-sector partnerships, including a partnership between the city of New York and Arab engineers and Google to launch later this year a demonstrator uh, of circularity in the built environment. This will actually be a circular building that will be constructed in New York City. And I think one of the reasons that, that these entities are interested in this is because they need to really drive the market for innovation. Right now, cities are not yet driving the market through procurement. We're seeing that in European cities like Copenhagen, but New York City is not yet um, doing that in, in a, in a full-fledged way. And so it's really the private sector that, that needs to carry the burden at this point as the cities play catch up with what corporations internationally have already recognized as an opportunity. And in terms of demonstration projects, I mean, one uh, thing to note on Governor's Island, for example, we built a new park. Uh, and shout out to the Dutch, we hired West State as our landscape architect. And if you're going to build a resilient park in the future, hire a Dutch landscape architect, I'll just tell you. Uh, they, they know how to deal with sea level rise. Uh, but one of the most interesting things that they did, we had a number of old um, apartment buildings that were on the south, southern part of the island. The apartment island, uh, the, the apartment buildings were demolished. And all the materials from the demolition were used as the foundation of one of the, our highest hills. Because as we think about it, it is so expensive for us to take things off of the island, it actually triggers the innovation of saying, well, what do we do with the stuff? Uh, and really triggering uh, creative design ideas of how we reuse materials that we have. Now, because we're this island, we have no way of getting stuff off of it. We're very, very incentivized to be creative in terms of it. But I would challenge all of us. I mean, Manhattan's an island. Brooklyn's an island. Staten Island is an island. Uh, we're all islands in many ways. So can we think hard about what are the costs of actually taking this stuff um, off of the land that we're on? Yeah, Jacqueline, please chime in. You're as the matchmaker of these um, collaborations. You know, what, what makes a successful partnership? Well, uh, coming back to our focus, we focus on product reuse and product redesign. Our main incentive here is that we create a, a huge demand in the market by promoting circular procurement. Not only by one company or one local government alone, but we join forces there. We set up communities of practice of local governments learning from each other and starting to launch circular procurement strategies on specific uh, products like uh, office equipment or building materials. And what they do, they join forces. That's, uh, of course, a trigger for the market to think, now it becomes serious. We have set up a similar community of practice with uh, um, 15 companies that are now also joining forces. So that is one strategy for the strategy of the 
uh, high value recycling, we had a very tailor-made approach. For every waste stream, or we call it resource stream, we have a dedicated strategy depending on how you can make a business case. And uh, let me take two examples. Uh, for instance, uh, we, we have now selected for the first round nine resource streams uh, and one of them is diapers. We first start to find out what can we technically do and what is the, the best option. Then we looked in the market who can really produce these best options. And then we selected a company that is now investing in recycling of diapers producing plastics, fibers, and energy. Another example is residual her, uh, or, uh, greenery. And uh, we uh, joined forces there um, with a, a number of municipalities and said, if you create enough volume, there will be a company that is willing to invest in making of uh, the uh, residual greenery new products like paper or uh, chemical compounds. And that is also now uh, in the making. What actually are the main preconditions, the key conditions for the recycling possibilities? Demand, enough demand in the market for the recycled products, enough volume to make a business case and, this, and the guarantee that the volumes will be provided quality of the uh, materials and uh, finally of course we have to ha have a uh, collection and logistics system and these are the preconditions taken, uh, that we take into account and then we make a business case with the partners needed to make it work that sounds simple of course it is quite a job to prepare all, uh, for all of that but as soon as i see it's going to happen I leave it to the companies that found each other and are going to set up the, the new um, investment. And of course, a precondition is that uh, sometimes municipalities, in the case of diapers, the, um, uh, the um, daycare centers are willing to provide the diapers for a long period of time in order to be certain about volume. So that is actually the deal we create. And if all the partners are uh, there and, and are uh, eager to invest, then we uh, um, jointly make a what we call circular commitment. And then I just let it go. Then it's going to happen. So in that way, we aim uh, till 2025 to create of 40 different resource streams, such high value recycling initiatives. And I think that in a capitalist democratic country like this one, all this change is going to have to be consumer driven. You know, we're depending on the private sector to lead on climate change, we're depending on the private sector to lead on sustainability, but they're not going to do that unless there's something in it for them. Um, and so I think that especially with the millennial generation being very mission aligned and how they spend their money, um, I think we're in a really good climate for that. And so that's why with my company, our first product that we're bringing to market is a cleaning product. It's an all natural organic cleaning product made from food waste. So that's like the sexiest thing that I could think of, that we could make that people could get excited about. Um, because nobody wants to talk about garbage because it's gross. Um, so I really think that, that focusing on creating the consumer demand, that's something we've also been talking about offline, um, is really what, at least in the US, is going to be the push that's needed for the private sector to partner with the public sector and actually create solutions. Yeah, and I think that the... In a, oh, well, sorry. may I interrupt for one moment? We also try to, to set up arrangements with consumers, but individual consumers are harder to mobilize than professional uh, consumers in the sense of professional uh, procurement uh, uh, departments. And they create much more leverage, uh, and uh, I see them actually as the front runners in order to make it possible for the market to change and the consumers to follow. But of course, there are products where the consumers need. 
but in the recycling business, the consumers are not the ones that can drive the change that easily. But I think it, uh, for, since we're in a smart cities conference and thinking about technology and the role of technology and innovation, I mean, it could be at every scale. I mean, if there's the kind of uh, food to energy market, you know, how do we just make energy out of our waste, which is probably one of the beneficial uses of um, waste products. Um, there's also small things that we could do. We were talking offline, uh, the trust was looking at something as simple as we want to decrease the amount of paper towels we use. You go to a, a restroom, you use a paper towel. So we want, so our only option is use electric hand dryers. Is there something in between, as Kate said? Can we innovate in that space where I don't have to make a binary decision between schlepping tons and tons of re recycled, but paper onto the island, I don't want to take it off, um, or is the alternative only to use an electric hand dryer? Or something, since you're all creatives here, uh, think about a good compostable straw that you can drink a frozen margarita out of. Uh, that is one of the biggest challenges we have because we are going straw-free this year, which is great to say, and you can only use a paper straw, but try to drink a milkshake or a frozen margarita out of a, a, a paper straw, uh, you got a real problem there. Well, I have really good news for you because Lollyware is a company we invest in that has uh, created biodegradable and edible straws for those drinks. So are they tasty? Th yeah, I have tasted them, and they're good. Um, I what are they made out of? What? What are they made out of? I th it's perhaps algae, but don't hold <laughs> me to that. But I, I have some work to do on their flexibility. <laughs> I think this question of the role that the consumer plays is a really challenging one because there's so much emphasis on, whereas consumer activism is critical, shareholder activism is critical, we need to hold these corporations responsible for the products that in some cases are ending up in our oceans. So that's an important piece of the puzzle. But this concept of green consumerism where we make our choices by buying something better is not going to lead to systems change. And I think even thinking about trying to get lunch in New York City, you go somewhere, they serve you your food in a plastic container, they put it in a plastic bag, they give you a plastic fork, and then they hand you a plastic water bottle. And when you try to fight against that, if you try to bring your own container, it's a burden on you as a consumer to fight against a system that wants you to do things in a certain way. Why would we serve food that we're going to eat within 10 to 30 minutes in a container that lasts hundreds and hundreds of years and may end up in our oceans. It's completely illogical. And so that sort of creative rethinking about the way that we do things now and, and accepting that there are innovative alternatives in the marketplace and that entrepreneurialism is a huge role in that means that when you're asking that question of, if there, is there an alternative to a plastic straw? Well, it, it is out there. The question is, how do we support those efforts and scale them? And, and when we're thinking about, when you're thinking about impact, I mean, Michael, you, you know, one of the things we talked about, you know, you, uh, a big part of your project on Governor's Island revolves around education, right? Because, uh, you know, it's important for people to actually see the behaviors that they could potentially adopt or you know, model the behavior or the kinds of products that, that could be incorporated or lifestyle choices that people could make to have a, an impact. What, when you think about your project on Governor's Island, how are you thinking about um, you know, the lasting impact that goes beyond sort of some of these demonstrations that you are having on the island? And what, you know, what are you hoping that the lasting impact will be of, of the work on, on the island? Well, in, in many ways, we view Governor's Island as a demonstration project for the next 100 years of how is good, sustainable urbanism going to deploy itself across uh, the city and really across the world. So from small things like compostable straws to big things like not having trash cans in restaurants, you don't have that uh, situation in Governor's Island. Everything is compostable that you're consuming. But environmental education is a big part of who we are as we see ourselves as a demonstration project and showing the public um, how's a better way to live. You know, we're a car-free environment. Imagine if cities were car-free. Uh, we, in many ways, are on the forefront of resiliency and sustainability and showing the public in a recreational environment. So we're not didactic. You're not going and sitting in a lecture and being told that this is the way you live your life. You're doing it through acting. Uh, and acting meaning you get a can of Coke and you don't get a straw with it. You're going to a restaurant and all of a sudden there's no trash can. You're walking on a beautiful hill, you hear, because we have um, a sign that tells you a third of that hill is recycled construction debris. 
you're walking up a beautiful, um, what we call the scramble, and there are old bits of the seawall that we reconstructed a couple of years ago that were brought to the island in 1902 and now remain there because it's a lot easier to make it into kind of a play space. So environmental education, I think, really is the key, but through demonstration. And because of the trust, we have, um, we are a benevolent dictatorship in that we control everything um, soup to nuts. We are able to be, I would say, on the cutting edge of experimenting, testing, and really looking like looking at Governance Island as a living lab for sustainability. And I, I would ask this to all of you, you know, Jacqueline, how are you thinking about measuring impact? Well, uh, of course, uh, what I explained, uh, we act at different levels. So uh, all the municipalities have their own um, targets. When I focus on the regional level in the Amsterdam region, we uh, formulated the following KPIs. We said we want in 2025 to reduce the environmental burden by 35%, the um, uh, dependency on import with 30%. We want to create 20 new uh, circular uh, product chains. We want to create 40 uh, circular resource streams with high value and a recycling per percentage of 90% on average. And we want to create 4,000 jobs, at least uh, half a billion of new um, financial benefits. And we also want to create an enormous amount of new businesses via innovation. So that are the, the targets uh, we are after. And uh, we're running in time. <laughs> we are already on uh, a uh, target. Our first target was 2018. And uh, well, we managed to meet these targets. Which target was in 2018? Uh, to uh, be able to uh, uh, recycle high value uh, at least nine uh, resource streams. And we're, we're going to manage that and also set up new uh, investments in that. And uh, to create a movement on circular procurement in the whole region. Amanda, how do you think about the impact, or how do you think about making an impact with your company? So, <clears throat> climate change has many causes and many effects. So we have soil erosion, we have a lack of uh, the ability to grow more food for people, we need to increase our food production in the future. We are you know, worried about water, you know, people say the future wars will be fought over water. And so food waste and waste is a contributor to this due to greenhouse gas emissions and methane emissions that come off of landfills, but it can also be used as a solution for that. So um, you know, the carbon that comes from food can be put into the soil, it can help take carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, and so we can use, in terms of circular economy, you know, we can use these resources to not only keep waste out of uh, the world, but to also solve some of these problems that it's caused. Kate, do you want to weigh in on that one? Sure. I mean, at, at our firm, we measure our impact in terms of greenhouse gas emissions avoided through capturing these resources before they go into a landfill. We measure the diversion of resources from a landfill. But but ultimately, it's, it's really about this idea that people are throwing money away, and we want to help them not throw their money away. So for example, in New York City, the city of New York spends $60 million a year disposing of New Yorkers' textiles. And that clothing has value in a secondary market and in many other markets. And so we're all throwing away money, and then the city is paying to help us throw away money. And so part of what our firm does is go to municipalities and do a very simple cost-benefit calculation. This is how much you spend to throw away things that you could make this much money from. And so you don't have to talk about sustainability or climate change, even though that those are the principles that are motivating us. It's a very clear-cut rationale for why this is a profit-based circular economic system that is better for your municipality or your brand or your startup, whatever the case may be. Final question for everybody. What is the most exciting project or development that you are watching right now? Jacqueline. Well, what I find most inspiring is to see that we create a movement of 
people that are all positive about making the change. Both businesses, uh, knowledge institutes, local authorities, and also the citizens. So uh, that's what really drives me. I see that people um, grasp the, op the opportunities and don't see it as a burden, but uh, as something positive. Um, the abandonment of plastics. So um, a effect of the trade dispute that's going on with China right now is China is not buying any of our recyclables, and they are we're the primary buyer of our recyclable materials. So it could end up driving us to move away from plastic, move towards bioplastic because of market forces, because recycling plastic is no longer profitable. Uh, I want to echo that, uh, what Amanda said. Uh, on Governance Island, one of the things we're most excited about from the circular economy and sustainability standpoint is the regulations that we're imposing on our food vendors, which I've said over and over again. But, you know, we've banned styrofoam, we've banned plastic bags, we've only used compostable uh, materials when it comes to the food waste. So that is a demonstration problem. I mean, 800,000 people visited Governor's Island last year alone. That's 800,000 folks that we've influenced and will continue to influence them and hopefully begin to change their behavior if they can certainly start demanding this. I think for me, in, in Europe, I'm excited at trends that I'm seeing. For example, in France, they're moving to ban retail stores from throwing out clothing. They're, they've, they've installed regulations about food purveyors throwing out food. And so they're using regulation to prompt innovative solutions to how do you dispose of these resources in a better way. In the US, I'm most excited about a project that the Center for the Circular Economy is working on with Starbucks. Um, it's an effort to create a 100% recyclable and sustainable cup. And the reason that Starbucks is doing this after working on this for 10 years to come up with this cup is that they recognize that there needs to be a coalition of all of the food service providers to come together and define what that cup can be that's more sustainable, that is not thrown in the garbage millions and millions of times every day. And so I think seeing that consortium building, that coalition building, is what gives me the hope that people can start to come together to solve for these really daunting challenges. That's very optimistic. I'm glad we're ending on that note. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for joining us, and thank you to our esteemed panelists.